All right, guys, so welcome back. Today, we'll be going over 10 things you should do before you graduate, uh, done by me. So the first one is cultivate grit. And so in particular, when you hear grit, um, what comes to your mind? And so for me, it, it meets these criteria when I hear grit. It has to do with having a strong work ethic, an attitude for challenge and tackling new problems, as well as the emotional intelligence to accept reality when it doesn't go your way, or when some things don't go in your way. So accept it as face value and you just move on. In particular, you might notice that I do like uh, Dilbert comics. So I'll be interjecting Dilbert comics every now and then. So why start with grit? Well, why, why not just jump straight into technical things you should, you should do before you graduate? Um, I think I would be doing a disservice to everyone if we don't start with grit because the truth is there's no syllabus for life. You're not, you don't go into college and graduate and then they give you a syllabus for life. And how, after you know, all of that, you meet, you meet these certain outcomes. That's just not how it works. So as you go through life, and for me, uh, it's the second law thermodynamics, you're gonna meet entropy. So if you know, if you're an engineer, and if you know anything about entropy, then you know uh, Thanos is right. You can dread it, you can run away from it, but entropy always arrives. And entropy is basically disorder. And we live in a universe where the second law thermodynamics hopefully does prove correct. And there's always gonna be disorder as a constant. Well, there's always gonna be disorder increasing also known as Murphy's Law. So if something may go wrong, it will go wrong most likely. Either it being plans, either it being you, you know, people disappointing you. So life doesn't go your way. But be, beside that, the fact that you're here today and the fact that you took the time to be here means that you're resilient beings of change and we all are, we're all capable of that. So when you go through life and you get slapped by problems or by whatever's going on, cultivate that grit and move on with it. And that's why it's important because you'll need it. But how do you do it? Right, so my, you might be saying this is great and everything, but how exactly do I start with that? How do I make that grit happen for me or cultivate that? It's pretty simple. And then for me, it, it took me a process of reading some books through a tough time I was in, but I recommend these books to anyone, particularly Mark Mason's book, The Subtle Art and James Clear, Atomic Habits. And it's pretty simple. The formula is actually very simple. Mark Mason describes it as having a self-awareness onion. So these are different layers that you would, um, that you would categorize your different feelings and your consciousness. But at the deepest layer, you would have personal values. And so everything else that you do falls around what you value the most. Makes sense, right? So if you're changing something as, as deep as your habits or as deep as your values, you want to, you want to start there first because it sur then surrounds your character. And on top of that, I would also recommend finding your cornerstone why. Because the moment you understand why you're doing things, everything else kind of falls in place. Then you can have the grit and not and, and bear with issues because you know it's just temporary. You know why you're doing it. That's why everything else falling apart. If there's other books you recommend, I'd love to take a look at them. But for the second one, you gotta look at the greater picture. And so looking at the greater picture also comes with planning. If you want to be able to understand the greater picture, not just look at it, you have to plan. And that plan doesn't have to be as detailed as micromanaging everything, but it needs to have a, a smart goals or needs to have smart goals. So what are smart goals? It's pretty simple. You wanna have goals that you can execute and they need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so you can apply these to every aspect of your academic life, your professional life, your financial or your personal life as well. Just please don't end up like this guy in the cartoon. So some examples of that, pretty straightforward, what would they be? Many people wanna graduate, me too, but you don't just wanna graduate because you can graduate with a bunch of crippling debt. You wanna be specific on, onto the conditions on how you wanna achieve that goal. So we'll move on to number two. You wanna graduate in BME, great. You could also graduate in CS or biology. So you wanna be very specific. As we, sense, as we move on to number five, you, we can see that the more details we add, the more that reality can materialize because we know what, what exactly we want to achieve. So another one, you want more money. Okay, here you go, a dollar, move on. But the reality is most people just want, uh, want specific outcomes with, with their goals, but they don't know the structure by how to put these goals into play. So that's the pattern. The pattern is that when you have these goals, you wanna plan for them, but you wanna plan just enough and just enough for you to actually start doing something because then you get into the process called analysis paralysis. And today, uh, where we live in an information age where there's so much data, anyone can become an expert at knowledge or a knowledge expert or subject matter expert. So I think what differentiates people who get stuck in analysis paralysis versus others who can actually get stuff done is that they execute on it. 
it doesn't matter how much information you know if you can't do anything tangible with it. So the do something principle I think is important. Once you understand something good enough or understand enough about it, do something about it. And then you can get results and get feedback on how to improve that process. And this is something that's regularly applied in engineering and regularly applied in self-improvement and regularly applied in quality assurance. So sometimes I think less is more because then you can get started. And it's better to get that first step in and to get those first steps and then just do nothing. Number three, and I think this is very important. You want to hone on financial education and you because you can be very book smart, undeniably. I met people smarter than me. But when it comes to handling finance choices, um, it just deserves a face palm. The good thing is you can learn it by yourself. So it is possible to learn it by yourself. There's a popular webpage called Investopedia and many other sources. But I would recommend getting started there. And you can learn about different asset classes and we'll go a little bit into each one. So paper assets, this is what most people understand when they hear investments. We're talking about stocks, bonds, options, futures, notes, CDs, and NFTs. And if you don't understand any one of these, feel free to ask me at the end, or if not, just search it up on Investopedia. It'll explain, I think, to a good extent, the basics of what each are. Then we have real estate assets. So unlike paper assets, they only exist as on paper or everything else electronic. But real estate assets refer to an actual physical property that you can search up somewhere online, or you can search up on the, on the county. And the most, the biggest one would be Forex and crypto. So in terms of the market for Forex and crypto is much bigger than what we would say uh, stocks or bonds. And the reason we're, the reason that's so is because we're talking about a greater, greater market by which these investments circulate. If you're talking about the United States and the global uh, economy versus a small market of stock or a particular bond. But what's interesting about these is that they always occur as a currency pair. So whether it's cryptocurrency or, or a normal currency, you're trading one currency or you're investing one currency in relative to another. So that's how these transactions occur. And the fourth major asset class would be commodities. So as the title says, they're related to actual fiscal products. So you can invest in diamonds or you can invest in gold or you can invest in petroleum and you would have the physical backing of that product so this is a, a caveat, investing is not trading. And the reason be, uh, investing is not trading is because they're handled differently from a tax perspective. So if you're investing, usually you're talking about holding whatever you're investing in for at least a year, and then you'll get a tax incentive. If you trade it, that means you're holding it anything less than that. And then you don't get any tax incentive. It's taxed at regular income, depending per income bracket. So if you wanna trade, good, that's fine. Everyone wants to trade. Um, if, you, if you want to trade for these reasons, then it's better that you're informed about the truth about trading before you make a decision. Now, I do want you to be as successful as anyone when it comes to trading, but the reality is that you're competing against people far greater than you in terms of resources and availability and knowledge. So much that you've been competing against computer algorithms that can go in and out in nanoseconds. If you're trading because you want to quit your full-time job, the reality is you're just trading one job for another. It is a full-time job. And then particularly for me, um, one thing that I noticed is that you don't produce any societal value except to yourself. And if you're about that, congrats. But what you would need to make this happen, you actually need a proper training. So you need to find someone to train you and a mentor can guide you for that or a resource group. That would not be me. You need the proper equipment and team. Uh, you need to get a broker. That's not Robin Hood. And you'll need to get a legit trading PC. So there's some setups you can look online on how to do that. And for your game plan, you'll need to know exactly what asset class you'll be trading or what type of portfolios you'll be trading and execute a strategy around that. More importantly, you'll need to know You'll need to be brutally honest with yourself if this is what you want to do, and you'll need to execute on your plan uh, to the T. Now that everything's done online and you have computer algorithms getting involved in trading, it wouldn't hurt for you to know uh, some computer science and coding because you'll be competing against other computer algorithms as well. You can make your own. Some trading books that you can get started on reading would be these, although I would just recommend investing. And please don't end up like this if you're, if you're trading, because now you know the reasons why. So inflation. Now, this is a valid reason why you should invest and what I recommend. Um, this is the outcome of 2020 stimulus checks, and this is a 12-month uh, period of inflation. So the next update for inflation is November 10th at the, at the time of this recording. And you'll notice inflation, since it's a 12-month period, it's a lagging indicator. So I would say these, these 12 months that are recorded for this 
year are actually including last year's months. The solution, you really wouldn't like it, especially if you're retired, if you haven't retired already or if you're a legal working age. Most people um, that are Gen Z's think they're going to work till they die, and that might be true. Also, uh, $15 an hour wage increase is not helpful. You're just proving my point at the state level because you're just increasing a dollar amount. It didn't increase the value or the economy at whatsoever. So invest. You should do that. Don't end up, don't end up like Dilbert. So I'm going to switch over to an actual technical uh, advice that would help you save your time and automate your email. So I'll switch over to Gmail right now. Can you see my Gmail? You can just type in the chat, yes. So I'm going to say it's on my Gmail. And this is what I have on a daily basis for my email. It's mostly up to date, but I do have some things that I left in red. And look at the amount of emails I have, 17,000. Almost, yeah, around 17,000. So let's automate this email. And let's begin with first with categories that I really don't wanna see anymore, like this handshake. So we're gonna go here and click filter messages like these. And it's gonna filter all our messages from handshake that we've had before. And you can apply this to your personal email, to your professional email, whatever you wanna do. Create a filter. And then you go to skip the inbox because I don't want it. And in this case, since I don't want it, I want to delete it. So not even skip the inbox, just straight delete it. And I also want to apply it to all these filter matching conversations. So this is one application that you can do for it. You can also categorize it in a way that archives it for you automatically, saves it for you automatically, or forwards it to another email automatically. So look at this filter that was created. And if we go to all my deleted, look at all these handshake emails that I have deleted. And it's pro look, it's around 700 handshake emails that I deleted since I started here at FIU. So how much did that bring me down? It went from 17,420 to 16,670 emails. Um, let's see if we can do that again. So let's choose any other, any other application or a digest. And let's filter emails such as these, right? So look at all my core emails I would get to my FIU account. We're gonna create a filter around this. And since I happen to like Quora, I'm gonna skip the inbox. I'm gonna apply a label. And I'm going to choose a new label called Quora. So I'm typing a new label. So there it is. Now I have a new label called Quora. And everything that's, that's going to go there will be archived to that category. So let's check the conditions, skip the inbox, done. Apply a label Quora. And you can apply all these other conditions, but we're just going to create the filter. We're going to give it a minute for it to process the information. Let's give us a color. And now the filter is created. So we go to Quora and where are my, where are my, all my core emails? Right there. Priceless. Save yourself a lot of time. So let's switch over to the presentation. Automate your email or your Gmail or your Hotmail, whatever you have. So let's say it took me 20, 10 minutes to do this. You know, the regular daily routine of reading through my emails, checking which one I, I like, you know, not checking, oh, you know, sending, deleting the ones I don't like. If I add that up to a year, that's around 60 hours or 61 hours of productivity in quotation marks. So what does it come down to? It comes down to asking yourself, what is your most important commodity? And for me, that would be time. So when it comes to time management, these other apps definitely don't help. And one reason why I don't have any social media, and I, I recommend anyone shouldn't have any social media. So number five, polish skills beyond class. So class is nice and everything. It teaches you stuff, and I learned some things as well. But if you want to make yourself different from other people and make yourself an actual valuable candidate to your to a job or to anything you want to apply yourself at, then obviously you got to think of ways to make yourself different. Uh, take that extra step. You got to learn those skills, whether that means going on LinkedIn Learning or whether that means maybe going to Coursera or maybe going to Skillshare. So however you wanna learn those skills, you gotta find a way, whether that includes anything that complements your major, technical or not technical. If you wanna take a creative route and do music on the side, that's fine as well. But for me, I, uh, some skills that I've honed on included uh, SolidWorks, Fusion 360, some, some, some simulation, and more recently I've done, um, I've tried to acquire manufacturing skills. 
as well as some statistics. So here's the thing. You wanna do this on your own time, but you'll do it for free. And the reason for that is, first of all, you're not an expert. Um, but second of all, if you do like it, then you'll do more of it and then you'll become an expert. And so if Cookie the Palm can do it, you can do it as well. And this is where you're gonna apply those skills. You're gonna set up time to actually do projects outside of class. While everyone else might be doing, I don't know, living your life, you're gonna apply those skills that you learned because you're gonna put them to good use and you're gonna start making a portfolio out of it. You're gonna document everything. And it's, it's gonna be even better if it complements the major or the field that you wanna work in. So those skills are directly transferable. Wally is a genius, uh, and this is Wally. He's a genius because he's inspired from an actual person. Um, once the actual person learned that his company was offering compensation packages for the top 10 lowest scorers in the company, that was his new goal. And so a person like Wally is a hidden genius because he's lazy, but he's purposely lazy because he knows his objectives. So we're gonna do with all those uh, projects. This is the next step. You wanna build a brand image. And building a brand image is gonna be the, the platform. Or it's gonna be the, yeah, the platform that you're gonna use to project yourself in the marketplace. It's just gonna set you apart from everyone else. So you need to choose a platform, whether that's a professional platform, um, if you're an employee, on a handshake platform if you're a student, a core platform if you wanna do Quora, or if you're a, a gamer, depending, or musician, you know, maybe Spotify, Twitch. You wanna include your work and showcase it. So whatever it is, whether that's portfolio, resume, um, curriculum vitae, if you're a researcher, then you already consolidated it. You, you made put in the time and you actually did it. Now comes the best part. You can control the story to however you want. And the main, the main objectives from that is that you wanna do some marketing. So I took a marketing class before I graduated. Um, and it's helped me very great understand the different types of target audiences that people sort look for and, and reach out to when they're trying to make a message across. And it really helps in terms of communication skills and getting your story across. So when you market yourself uh, through these platforms, you can make the story however you want. How do you present your work? And what's that objective? Uh, what values do you want to other people to understand when they look at your work that you, that you emphasize or that you manifest? Or what does this let other people know about you and what you do? And so by the end of it, if you actually do a good job, and then this is what you're gonna, what's going to happen. You're going to create a pipeline of people that are, you're targeting to come for you instead of you looking for them. And so once you have this pipeline or this target audience, then you have more leverage in terms of options and in terms of visibility that you will gain because more people will be looking at you. Um, and this is Dogbert. He's the consultant for the company Dilbert works for. So in situations where you actually want to reach out to other people, since not everyone, you know, everyone starts somewhere, this is one way to do it. So whether that's LinkedIn, whether that's Handshake or whichever other platform you use, and I'm assuming you want to get a job. So there's some assumptions, but you can also apply this for, for professional connections, regardless of whether you want a job or not. But let's say you want a job. How do you do that? Oh, you want to connect with hiring managers. And the reason why it's hiring managers and not recruiters is because recruiters are what you call gatekeepers. Gatekeepers? They filter people. They, they filter people on purpose because that's their job. But their interest is to find the best candidates, not necessarily to connect with you. So the reason why you, you want to find the hiring managers is because they are the decision makers. So whoever makes that decision, whether it's a hiring manager or someone above the hiring manager or an engineer or a senior engineer, you want to connect with that person. And even better, if it's related to the, a specific company division that you want to work at. So let's say you're interested in biomedical because you're all biomedical here, I'm assuming, or you're all engineers. then let's say you, you like the cardiovascular division or you like the manufacturing division, find out who's a manager for that and connect them, connect with them on that platform. It's also even better if it's a, to a specific product that you actually wanna work at in the future or that they're doing improvements on or continuous improvements. So let's say you're an Apple fan and you just love you know, Apple, the features they, they put in it, but you wanna you know, be that next wave of change to, to Apple products. So connect with whoever's in power right now, uh, whoever makes that hiring management decision. And third, um, if it's related to a future position that they may, would manage directly either or indirectly through someone else. So since you can connect with a hiring manager who, who manages other managers, or you can connect with a senior engineer who manages other engineers. So, and once you have those five managers from each company, 
that you connected with or that's in your interest, you want to find one of them to have a Q&A session. And so that's either on LinkedIn or whichever platform, reach out to them and see if you can hold an informational Q&A session. And so the difference between job hunting and networking is that job hunting means that there's strings attached because the condition is you get the job or you don't. But if you're networking, it, it can any, anything goes. So you just want to have a chat with networking. And that's the main difference. There's no strings attached. And for a hiring manager, that's better because it's just a casual talk versus a business decision. So what are you going to talk about? Well, you're going to talk about the same points or the same reasons as to why you connected with them in the first place, because that's the relevant application of it. Um, it's related to the vision, product, or position. And the, the primary outcome that you want to understand with this, as you discuss with them, is that you want to learn about the culture, the team, the environment, and the work opportunities available, as well as the people. How is it over there, you know, since you'll be working for a big chunk of your life? And some examples of questions you can ask them, you know, is what do you enjoy the most about this company? Be honest about it. Uh, what's unique about the product that you particularly work with that's different from other products in the market or that's different from other products in the company? What's so unique about the staff um, that you work with or what are some team dynamics that you usually do? As from a manager position, you can ask them what a normal day it is from that manager position or from that managerial position. Most of the time they will be splitting their, their, um, their business hours between planning for the future and taking care of situations in the present as a managerial position. From an engineer perspective, they might be something along the lines of uh, working out technical uh, issues with a product or continuous improvements with testing. And you can also ask them what is one rewarding aspect or what is the most rewarding aspect from this position that is not found elsewhere. So these questions, that, um, they, they sound unique. And the truth of the matter is, if you're interested, then they really are. The, dif the difference just falls on you, whether you are interested. And finally, if you really like this position or if you like uh, the, this division or, or position or product, then you want to project yourself into that future position. Ask them genuinely, what are some habits or skills that I can improve to envision myself in this future position because I want to do a good job, right? And most of the time, they'll give you honest feedback. So once that Q&A session is done, you want to be prompt with your time. So if you reach those 10 to 15 minutes max that you said you would take your time for, then tell them that this is enough time. Thank you for the feedback, but I want to cut it here. And this is this feels good on your part because you were you deliver what you promise. So I give thanks for feedback and you offer to stay in touch with them. Pretty simple, right? But most people don't follow up. So you, actually, you want to actually follow up. And this is what sets other people apart. So if it all goes well, outcomes that you, you would get from this, you would get actual connections in the industry that you want to get a job, or you might consider getting a job. And if later you change your mind about this industry, that's okay. You'll never know what doors um, close and which ones open. But at least now you understand what options are available for you. So don't go ahead and say that you don't know what you want to do when you graduate, because that's not an, that's not an option anymore. You know this is in your arsenal. And more importantly, if you do like this position so much, or you just think you'll be a nice fit for this company or for this, whatever it is, this team, then now you have a blueprint as to where or what gaps you need to improve on so you can reach that. And it's not, it's not coming from just anyone like me. It's coming from someone who actually had that position or who has that position right now. So after all of that, you say thanks, you you're considered their time. And it falls on you at the end of the day if you want to, if you like a position or not, because you're taking time off from that person's day to talk to them. So don't end up like this guy. Number eight, you want to ain't things slash act like an entrepreneur. And so I've been involved before with a student organization at FIU called uh, Startup FIU, and I think it's fantastic. And the reason why I like uh, that particular group of, of students is because they, they get involved in entrepreneurial activities and they have discussions as entrepreneurs and they love talking about business plans and that stuff. But what's different from entrepreneurs versus employees and versus other people in general? Yes, you do, you do, solve, them, you do solve problems and you do troubleshoot and you do change um, things that, have, that, that need to be solved. But entrepreneurs, they take that first step and they are pretty honest with their feedback or they're pretty honest um, and they put their money where their mouth is where no one else wants to because they're building infrastructure most of the time where it doesn't exist. Or they're building something that's not there before. Or they're delivering a product that was non-existent 10 years ago. So they execute and work harder than everyone else to get to what they want to achieve. And in that sense, they're the physical manifestation of the change that is needed in this world. And because of that, they fail a lot of times. But still, they move past that and they don't take no for an answer. So they know what they want to achieve. And then should they reach a level of success that's very profitable? in the process, 
they also brought a lot of people together uh, for jobs. And I would think that's a win-win for the solution for everyone. And the reason why I guess entrepreneurs are like this is because they understand and they see something that no one else can. And the thing about progress is because is that no one recognizes progress as it's being made. They just see the final output, which is called success. But the real success is in doing deep work. And entrepreneurs understand that. So they take the risk, they put in the work and they get it done. And should they become millionaires? Well, I, I think they earned it because they, they did it. So this is a, another Dilbert comic. I love it because it's not on my face. So number nine, you want to leave some time for reflection because not everything is, is just doing. Uh, you want to be cautious and be conscientious about the things you do. And on top of that, you want to give thanks and help others achieve that same level of success because I think um, success is fun or even more fun when you have a team to do it and when you bring other people along that journey with you and you all succeed together. And last but not least, you want to smile because we determine our own meaning in life and value in our life with a, in a world that doesn't have any. Some more examples of smiles. And uh, about me, so if you want to connect with me afterwards, I'm okay with that, but everything expressed here are my own opinions and I met other people that would uh, wholeheartedly disagree, but that's pretty much it. Hope you guys enjoyed that.